And, you know, there, there was a guy, his, his, there was a guy, his name was Kurt uh, Wagner, not Kurt Warner, Kurt Wagner. This guy was, was the bodyguard of Hitler. Yeah, so back then. Uh, he was his, kind of his right-hand man there. And when Hitler died, he basically, this guy almost deified Hitler. When Hitler died, this man was about to take his life. Because he thought it was all over, it was done. He was about to take his life. And he went for one last cup of coffee. And there on the table, by that cup of coffee, was a gospel track, tract. He was first a little curious as he read it, and then it began to poke him a little bit more. This man then began to seek out a pastor, explain this to me, what's this about? God sending his son Jesus to die for my sins. By faith in him, I could be saved. The man ends up giving his heart to Christ. God says, you're now a new creation. He went on then to become a pastor of two different churches, a Methodist pastor, two different churches in Frankfurt, Germany. You think that God can't change people? If God could take somebody in that situation with that much evil going on and save them, our God is able. And here's what I'll note for you is that God not only wants to save men out of their situation, he wants to change them from the inside out and then he wants to use them for his glory. I mean, you think about that. That's this reality. Salvation brings a transformation which leads to a mission. To think that God would ever want to use you after you've shook your fist at him and said, I hate your guts. Don't ever do anything in my life. Get out of my life. Leave me alone. And God says, though I still love you. I want to save you. I want to change you from the inside out. And then I'm going to use you in a way you've never thought possible to change others for me. That's an absolute miracle. That's really your take home today is that God saves us to use us for the glory of Jesus. If you fall asleep on me, make sure you write that down and you got that. God wants to save you and use you for the glory of Jesus in your life. And we're here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this wonderful section of scripture that Paul, writing to this church in Corinth, tells them this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. We'll stop right there for a moment. First notice that he says in verse 17, if anyone, last I checked, anyone means anyone. He's not looking at race. He's not looking at sex. He's not looking at ethnicity. He says anyone. He's not looking if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat or if you say mean tweets or you don't know what you're saying at all. He doesn't look at any of that stuff. He says, anyone, anyone, the gospel message is open for anyone. If anyone is then in Christ, what does it mean to be in Christ? I know what it means to, we know what it means to be in debt. <laughs> we know what it means to be in love. We know what it means to be in over our heads. It almost carries this, this connecting, this grafting in. If anyone is in Christ, enveloped in him, they're a new creation. Well, how does that happen? The Bible tells us, it gives us this, it's laid out in the gospel. It says this simply that if I was to give you the gospel, that God made heaven for you. He made heaven for you. It's a, it's a free gift. Some of you guys are going to get this. It's a free gift. It's not earned or deserved. You know, it, he made it for you to be with him forever. But a problem came. Man disobeyed God. And that's called sin. Sin, it means missing the mark. We've missed the mark of God's perfection. And as a result of sin, there was three things that happened. There was separation from God. There was death that came in. And sin began to trap us and eat us up and holds us in bondage. And then we have this reality that God, as a holy God, must judge sin. And so we're underneath a judgment. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of his glory. It tells us the wages of my sin is death. I'm separated from God. So God is here. I am here. Now what? How do I get to the heaven he's created? Well, that's the beauty of the gospel. The bad news is you're separated from God. Your sins have done that. And you've seen the shame, the embarrassment, and the ruin from sin. 
But the good news is that God acted. He sent his son, who was both God and man, to pay the price for your sins and to purchase a way for you to get to heaven. He died on the cross. He rose again. He did the work for you and I that we might have, a, have hope and have life, eternal life with him. And so the question then becomes, how do I get to heaven? If God did this work, made a way, paid the price, purchased me a way to get to heaven, how do I get to heaven? Well, the Bible calls that faith. And faith is simply putting that trust in God. Who he is, what he said, what he's done. I'm putting all my trust in that. It's not a head knowledge where we would just say, hey, I know who he is. Because the Bible says even demons know who God is and they tremble. They know who he is. It's no big deal if you know who God is. I know of God. I believe God, you know. It's not the head knowledge. It's not a fleeting knowledge where you just kind of go, well, you know, God saved me now. Okay, I trusted you, and now I'm doing my own thing. It really is a, it's a saving faith where I put my full trust in God and who he is, what he's done, what Christ has done on the cross to save me from my sin. And when I do that, there's this incredible miracle that takes place. I go from being in sin, trapped in my sin, underneath the weight of God's judgment, to now coming into the family of God by that one decision of placing my faith in Christ's work. I leave that place of sin, come into the family of God. And I'm not just in his family, like positionally, like, well, you're kind of the, the, the stepchild in the corner, I give you no attention. He says, no, you're in my family. I call you my kid. You have been conveyed from being an enemy of God to now being called a child of God, a friend of God. It's an absolute miracle. And God starts to change you then from the inside out. He says you are a new creation in his eyes. Not a renovated creation. You're not the fixer-upper. He says, no, you're a brand new creation in my eyes. As John 3 says, Jesus was talking to a man at night and he says you must be born again or born from above. It's a new birth, a new creation. We've all seen like the moth or the caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. And we recognize that the caterpillar uh, and, the, and the butterfly are, are two different arenas. The caterpillar is living on the ground, eating the, eating the leaves and stuff, knows nothing of what it's like to fly and, 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 and fly in the sky. But that metamorphosis takes place. And that caterpillar is changed into a butterfly to do what it never could do before. The beautiful work of God in the life of us. And here is the kicker, is that I am, I'm not the same anymore because of Jesus. I'm not the same. I've seen it. I've seen it time and time again in people's lives. They're just not the same. They don't, they, oh, you may say, well, they deal with life differently. No, this is different from, oh, I turned over a new leaf. This is like, you're not the same person. You don't even look the same way. You don't look the same, you don't act the same, your motives are different, and people can't figure you out. And all you know is that Jesus just changed me, changed me from the inside out. But God sees me. He sees me as his child, and I'm alive in a whole new way before him. The beautiful thing is that I'm not just forgiven, I'm changed forever. God's amazing work, and he does it through the gospel. Verse 18 tells us very clearly, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ brings us back to himself. The cross tells you and I, look, the penalty is paid for for your sins. It's an amazing thing. You're not under the judgment of God because of the cross. The cross tells you the power of sin is no longer mastery over your life. You're free from that. And the cross tells you one very day, soon I believe, the very presence of sin would be gone from your life. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. There's no more pain. The former things have passed away because you're going to be in heaven with the Lord. The power of the cross, the blood of Christ to make you clean. That when God looks at you, he doesn't look at you in that sinful state. He sees you in that holy state, pure and spotless because of the blood of Christ. Absolutely incredible. And that's what it means to be in Christ. The gospel conveys us to be in Christ. As Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's what? It's the power of God unto salvation. It brings men to Christ. So if any man is in Christ, they are a new creation. And if I am in there and I'm called to live differently, I'm called to reflect him, 
then what does that look like? Well, not only am I changed from the inside out, here's the kicker, that God wants to put me on mission for his glory. Look at verse 18, the second half. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You realize that when God saves you, he doesn't just put you in a, a trophy. How many of you guys have trophy cases? No, we don't have those anymore, do we? <laughs> You go to a high school, they got the trophy case, right? There it is, this glass case, and everything is there. There's like all these names on these things. Oh, this is State Champs 1991. I was on one of those. State Champs 19. And all it does is speak of the past. There's no dust in it, or maybe there is a little bit. It does no use, no purpose but to speak of the past. God says, I'm not making you a trophy. I'm making you a vessel, a conduit to use presently and in the future. I want to fill you. I want to use your life for my glory and for people's salvation. You go from salvation from sin to now being on mission for God. And the mission has this label, reconciliation. Well, it tells us there's a problem going on, not only between us and God, but us and each other too. You faced it before. You've had to reconcile. You've had an argument with your spouse or with a friend or with somebody that, and it's divided you and you're on this side and they're on that side. And maybe it's years that you've even conversed with each other. And, and now God starts poking you and say, let's, let's reconcile this. And what did you have to do? You had to connect with that person. And then you had to say, hey, let's, let's find this common ground and let's, let's go forward together. That's reconciliation. But here's the thing. God didn't need to reconcile with us. We needed to reconcile with him. And God made the way out of love for us, out of mercy and forgiveness. He says, I'll make the way and send my son so that we could be reconciled. It's an absolute incredible thing. Sin has separated us from God and God acted. And in verse 19, he says, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. How did he do that? Not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed us the word of reconciliation. He was in Christ. He was ministering truth and his love and he was revealing uh, through the cross he would take the debt of my sin upon himself that I might be saved. And it says there he is no longer, he's not imputing their trespasses to them. He's not counting it to us. That's what that word means. It actually comes from the word that means logical, to make sense, to compute, to take into account, to balance the books, you might say. Not just my past sins, but every sin I've ever committed in my whole life. You see, this reality is that God doesn't count our sins. He cancels them. The math goes like this. My sin plus Christ's blood equals a clean slate. And now we are entrusted with this mission. We are called to reach the world for Jesus. But it's not a, a drudgery of have to. It's a delight of I get to. I can't believe God would want to use my life to help change people and to change them for his glory. But what authority do we have? Well, verse 20 tells us, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. An ambassador represents a country. They represent the leader of that country, his heart. They almost become like a voice to share the, the will of that country, the heart of that country, the, 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 the voice of that country. And, and so God says, you're my ambassadors in this world. You are then pleading and begging with people. God has done the work and you can be reconciled to him. You can be free from all that sin and all that bondage and all that shame and guilt. And you can come into this beautiful relationship with God that he's made and have hope for all eternity. That's that message of reconciliation. That God through Christ has done all that was needed for us not only to be forgiven, but being, from being transferred from enemy of God to friend of God. And this is how he did it. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
Jesus didn't become the sinner. He who knew no sin became the offering for our sin on the cross. So my sin was transferred onto him who was the pure and spotless sacrifice. And by accepting that work on my behalf, there is called this great switcheroo. We've labeled it that before. I give him my sin, he gives me his righteousness. Who's getting the better deal? <laughs> Lord, here's my filthy rags, but I'll take your rich robes of righteousness. It's the heart of God for us. It's what he has done. So in Christ, I'm a new creation. And because of Christ, I'm now on God's mission and in that mission, what I need is a new vision. Because when we look at this section of Scripture, it's as almost God is saying, listen, I want you to look at people differently. You look at me differently. I'm not the guy who's going to thuck you on the head and, and just take you out. I'm a guy who came to save you. And you start to look at people differently and how they are and who they are. They're lost in need to be found. They're sinners in need of the Savior. They're hopeless in need of finding hope. And we have this wonderful message to give. Mission must have proper vision. Or else you end up beating people down and not building them up. And I love what Jesus at one point looked out to the crowd and he saw them. And he said they're like sheep without a shepherd. And what did he do? He ministered to them and he fed them. Would that we see people like sheep without a shepherd. To say let's get to the shepherd and get healed. Let, let's view them rightly because sometimes what happens is we can miss being used by God because we're not seeing people the right way. Sometimes you can see people through a cultural lens. Do I agree with how they look, what they're into, and do we have some type of commonality? And then, well, then maybe I could talk with them. And, and the Lord says, look, what did I do? I went to a, a woman who was a Samaritan at a well, outcasted and despised, and I talked to her. Why can't you do the same thing? Of course you can so don't look at people through the cultural lens. Don't look at them through the religious lens. Do they, do they agree with me in every point that I have? Do they, do they do these things and do this way? Then I could talk to them. No, we need to view people through God's lens. God says they're lost. They need a savior. I love them dearly and they need to come home. They need to be found. They need to know Christ. And our mission then becomes not getting people to be like us, but getting people to be like Jesus. The church is not a building. The church is the people. The church is the people. And in our, our conversations, we realize this, that when we interact with people, Jesus got muddy. He really did. And so why we, we get muddy too. Say, listen, I'll, I'll go talk with this person over here, and I'll, I'll go befriend this person over here, and I'll love this person, and I'll bless them. Whoever it is, I don't care if they're on their deathbed or they're brand new in Christ, but just to love them. I'm heading up to Denver. I headed up to Denver on Tuesday. I always have this thing where I get on a plane. I'm going to give you the secret. When you're traveling, when you get on the plane, take the first seat in the front that you can find. Why? Because 99% of the time it's going to be full. And why do I want to spend an extra half hour sitting in the back waiting for everybody to get out? Now you know my secret. But anyways, I get on the plane. It's Tuesday and I sit next to this. I'm sitting down. I've got a window seat. I don't care. It's a two-hour flight. I'm sitting next to this, this lady, this older lady. She's sitting there. You strike up conversation, of course, and you start talking about this, that, and everything. And, 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 and through the course of our conversation, I, uh, she mentioned something about church. And so I was like, bing! All right, hey, so, so where, where are you going? You know, and we start talking about these, these things. And uh, she goes to a Lutheran church over in Peoria. And she says, well, what do you do? And, she, and I said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And, uh, and she said this. She says, you know, I knew there was something different about you when you sat next to me. <laughs> and it wasn't because I was a pastor. I started talking to her about just the Lord and how wonderful God is and everything and encouraging her and she says, she has got tears in her eyes and she says, you know what? You remind me of my old pastor. He just kept telling us about Jesus. And I said, you know what? That, that's awesome because that's what we're here for. And then through the course of conversation, she tells me the tears in her eyes. Her husband of 60 years has now got dementia and she's just, you know, trying to make it through. And she says, can I add you to our prayer list at church? I said, you bet. I'll take any prayer I can. And when I left, she, 
after two hours of on that plane next to her, she was like, oh, she said, I'm so glad I met you today. And I, I just thought, you know, it wasn't me you met. You met the heart of Christ for every person. Now, listen, I've shared with people before. I've seen people in, in, in pain, and you go up to them, hey, can I pray for you? And they're like, no, get away from me. Okay, I'll just pray over here. Lord, Jesus, you know, can't stop prayer. But the Bible says that you are the fragrance of Christ. Believer, you're the fragrance of Christ. You're giving off a smell. And for some, it's the aroma of life. And for others, it's the aroma of death. But you're on mission. Whether you recognize it or not, if you know Jesus, you're on his mission. So Lord, give us eyes to see people the right way. That they may be reconciled to the Lord. And be made new. We're going to close out our time with a time of baptism. Which is a declaration that I've been made new. Because of Jesus Christ. But if you have never made that choice to accept Jesus Christ. I want to give you that time just briefly right now. If you need to get changed before we get baptized. Go for it. And then meet me back there. But let's bow our heads right now. Let's let's just pray. Thank you.